You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 163 of the Common Descent Podcast. We today are talking about claws. Claws. The claw. Claws are a a standard feature among most vertebrate animals. Uh, Tetrapod are land-walking animals. Claws are those... Little hard curved parts at the ends of the toes and fingers. Yep. Most most of us have probably gotten on the wrong end of a claw once or twice. Yep. These structures are very common, very familiar, and fairly straightforward as structures, but very diverse, mm-hmm. with some very interesting history and difficulty defining sure. certain versions and aspects. So we are going to go through and talk about What makes a claw a claw? Like, how do we define it? What do we see them used for? How do we see them taking different forms? But also, what do we know about their evolution? And how do we study them in the fossil record? Yeah, there's a lot of cool examples of claws today and in extinct animals. Indeed. So this episode will be a lot of fun. We are discussing it also because it is requested. This episode was suggested by Jared, Patty B, Susanna, and Jacob. So thank you for those requests. Before we move into the main topic, let's knock out some quick announcements. Our first announcement, as always, is that we have a Patreon. Our Patreon funds the podcast top to bottom through the gracious support of our patrons. And when you sign up for our Patreon, you can get some extra goodies like extra bonus audio, bonus info and content about the episodes, extra contact with us and monthly chats. And at certain levels, you'll get your name shouted out when you join us. We would like to welcome our new patrons, Harrison, Danielle, and Bridget. Welcome, and thank you for supporting us. As with all of our patrons, a big thanks. Absolutely. If you're interested in checking the Patreon out, you can find the links down in the description, along with links for our social media and other ways to get in contact with us, including our mailing address, which we have gotten some mail recently. We got some an Easter postcard from our listener, Elizabeth, along with a magazine about some uh, uh, 70s superheroes. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, down in the episode description, you'll find that physical mailing address and then just all sorts of ways to support us. Uh, like you said, social media, also our merch store, also a link to an Audible free trial that supports you and also us here at the podcast. All sorts of cool stuff. Yes, yes, yes. You'll also see down there a link to another podcast, because recently I was a guest on the Sprites of Life podcast, which is our friend Lucas's new podcast about the science of video games. In that episode, we talked about the specifically new Paradox Pokemon from the recent Pokemon games. Mm -hmm. And so we discussed a bit about the past versions of some of these Pokemons that were portrayed and what that suggests about the life history of those Pokemon. Yeah. So very cool. Check that out. Uh, Go check out that podcast and support our friend Lucas. It was a ton of fun, so please enjoy. And actually, you will find links to two different podcasts down in the description, because we also recently appeared on I Know Dino. Yes, we did. So in our last episode, we had Sabrina and Garrett, the hosts of I Know Dino, join us as our news guests, which was a lot of fun. We also went over to I Know Dino to talk about news on their podcast. So down in the episode description, you'll find a link to I Know Dino episode 437. They are well ahead of us. <laughs> I think they release weekly, so they, they go a little quicker than we do. <laughs> episode 437, the first long-necked dinosaur. Check that out and you will hear us discuss a piece of news we haven't discussed on our podcast. So yes. if you like the news, there's a little extra one about the evolution of hollow bones and dinosaurs. And then we also talked about sleep and other fun stuff. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And now we're, we're doing our news like the MCU. You have to go follow it across right, multiple you, you gotta, things. There, this is now a shared <laughs> podcast universe. <laughs> and then final announcement. Coming up, we're coming up on summer, which means Croc and Snake Month is coming up. We are doing it again this year. Croc and Snake Month are back. June is Croc Month. July is Snake Month. We've got a bunch of cool stuff planned uh, like we did last year. We'll be talking about Crocs and Snakes throughout all of our various podcast stuff. We'll have special Discord channels 
on our Discord for Crocs and Snakes, and we have some bonus content planned. And indeed, if you are a patron, you have the opportunity to specifically help us to create some of that bonus content. If you go to the Patreon and check some recent postings, you will see what we mean. Uh, Don't miss it. Find that post, get involved, and help us create some of the content we have planned for Croc and Snake Month for 2023. Yeah, no, please help us out. More details to come. And with that, we can wrap up the announcements and move on to the first section, the news. Every episode, we like to go through recent science news articles on new research and discuss it with you all, with us, keeps us all up to date. First up, David, what's the news? I have my first bit of news about large swimming amphibians from the Paleozoic, specifically fossil evidence that gives us an idea of how they moved through the water. Oh, cool. Which is a thing we uh, don't often get to study. This is research by David Gronwald et al. in PLOS One. And in our blog post that goes along with this episode, we will link to an article in Smithsonian Magazine written by Riley Black. The amphibians in question in this study are temnospondyls. We talked about temnospondyls a bit in the last episode, since our last episode was about amphibians. We talked about early amphibians a bit. These were medium to large sized amphibians, not very much like our amphibians today. A completely extinct group from back in the Paleozoic. Temnospondyls were major predators, especially common in the later parts of the Paleozoic. This study is looking at fossils from the Karoo Basin of South Africa, a region of the geology called the Lower Beaufort Group, which dates to the late Permian, so just over 250 million years ago. There are temnospondyls known from this area, and they all belong to a particular group called rhinosuchids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like a lot of temnospondyls, these looked kind of like big salamanders. They had salamander or croc-like bodies, and they got up to the sizes that you'd expect from, well, the largest modern salamanders, but also small to medium-sized modern crocs. Mm -hmm. This region has plenty of body fossils, so actual skeletal remains of these temnospondyls, but not many trace fossils. Body fossils can tell us a lot about the structure of the body, but if we want to understand how they interacted in their environment, trace fossils are very handy. This study identifies some trace fossils. These fossils are found on a paleo surface, so that this ancient rock layer that was once an ancient shoreline. Uh, this is called the Dave Green Paleo Surface, named after Dave Green. On this surface of rock, there are plenty of footprints, fish trails. We've talked about this where the swimming of fish, their tails swooshing will leave little furrows in the sediment. Which is just so del- delightfully delicate. I love it and includes several large traces that seem to match the size and shape of temnospondyls, these large amphibians. Specifically, they reported seven body impressions. So what appear to be resting traces, places where the body just settled on the bottom, and several swimming traces, similar to those fish traces where the tail is pushing the body along and leaves marks in the sediment. They note that all these traces seem to be a similar size and even roughly line up with each other. Ooh. So they interpret that this might be just one or two individual temnospondyls resting in one place, swimming over to the next resting place, and then swimming over. This might be, I think the the Smithsonian Magazine article, uh, Riley describes it as potentially a day in the life of this temnospondyl. Yeah, exactly. That it's just moving along the shoreline periodically resting on the bottom as it putters from spot to spot. Yes. Based on the traces, they estimate that this animal would have been about two meters long, so about six feet. So again, a small gator or croc. Absolutely. Or large for some species. (laughs) And not only is this cool to get extensive trace fossils from a large amphibian, there is also some evidence here to suggest how they moved through the water. The shape of the swimming traces, they note, is consistent with a continuous back and forth motion of the tail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The same thing we see that crocs and gators use to swim, and which we see in a, a number of salamanders today as well, where they use their tail in a continuous oscillating motion to propel themselves through the water. 
They also noted that the body impressions have tail impressions behind them, as you'd expect, and those impressions are quite deep, which might indicate big, heavy tails yep, yep, yep. that they were using to propel themselves through the water. And this part uh, is a little extra fun note. Based on the shape of the body impression, they did describe in the paper that in the resting traces, right at the base of the tail in a few places, they noticed these little lumpy bulges Mm -hmm. that might have been the shape of the legs sort of held close to the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that they didn't notice very much in the way of footprints or claw dragging or whatever, which leads them to suspect that these animals were likely swimming with the tail while holding the legs close up against the body, like we see in crocs and gators today. Very cool. So not only were these croc and gator sized and roughly shaped, they were probably swimming and moving using the same patterns and behaviors that we see in modern crocs. Which makes perfect sense for that body shape. That's a very you know, hydrodynamic, efficient way to swim if you're shaped that way. That's, sure, that's we, the way to do it. We see lizards do that. Mm-hmm. We see uh, salamanders do that. Like, that's that's how you do it if you don't want to waste energy. Uh, the the puttering and stopping, you know, swimming and stopping, also feels very crocky because you'll see sure. that with crocs of, like, you know, moving and then just hovering in the water and then moving them again and then hovering either as they're just making their way cautiously or just leisurely through an area. Mm-hmm. Uh, I it, The resting spots also though made me think of, you'll find stuff like that on the shoreline where crocs are, where they were basking and then slid into the water. You'll see a little body print and then a slide mm-hmm. along the mud. And it makes me wonder if we would ever find something like that for Timnus Mondels. If they oh, ever, yeah. did they bask? Did they keep themselves up in the sun at all right right or were they doing it differently because they had different skin and whatnot yeah this seems to at least this particular pattern Mm -hmm. of traces seems to be resting on the bottom of the water is that in the water underneath and then swimming around probably trying to find the best place to snap up some fish right right very cool yeah and we get direct evidence of how they moved uh, along during the day which is something we rarely see in fossils well and riley beck's uh, a comment of like a day in the life is is great and i often say when we talk about trace fossil news it is so cool that trace fossils can give us that mm-hmm. in a way basically nothing nothing else can of like no no you're witnessing behavior in the the, the fossil record and that's very cool yes my first bit of news is uh not really connected to that but it is about ants uh, which, for any fans of Bonus News, you'll know we've been talking about a lot lately. Yeah, we've mentioned ants <laughs> on the main podcast and in Bonus News on our Patreon. We Ants have been pretty common. Ants. Ants. This research is specifically looking at the connection between ants and plants, which we've also mentioned before is a famous connection that in flowering plants, angiosperms, and ant success tend to go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. This research was wanting to find more direct quantitative support for that connection in their evolutionary history. This is research by Matthew Nelson et al. in Evolution Letters, and the article is a press release in phys.org by the Field Museum. So first and foremost, as many of us know, ants are, as the article put it, pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. They are on every continent but Antarctica, in just about every environment on those continents, there's the the number they gave, which, you know, is a constantly changing one, is around about 14,000 different species. And one of the big questions that often comes up is how did they become globally dominant? You know, what was the process? Because that is an extreme degree of success. We don't see many other groups of life that can compare to that. And so the question of how did we get from, at some point, one species of ant to all the ants that you could think of. And the connection between ants and angiosperms is a well-known one, that they prospered and diversified alongside flowering plants, and that both seem to have evolved around the same time 140 million years ago. And so that connection has always been noted and well-established. This research was wanting to put more data behind that and investigate 
the patterns of that connection. They looked at 1,400 modern ant species and the climates they inhabit, as well as the environments they're found in, with data like temperature and precipitation included. And they combined that with a time-scaled reconstruction of the ant phylogenetic tree. So looking at ant relationships and the timing of those splits of new species and different groups, using that data together, they can get a rough idea of what behaviors and lifestyles we could expect to be seeing throughout the history of ants because that is a deeply genetic feature of ants. You know, the behavior, the habitat, the way an ant lives is something that is strongly connected to its lineage. So if we parse out its relationships, we can get an idea for how its ancestors likely would have been behaving based off of who they are also related to. They then compared that with information about plant evolution, and together were able to put together a story of the last 60 million years of angiosperm and ant evolution and the patterns they followed. And what they found was interesting. About 60 million years ago, ants mostly lived in forests, from what we can tell, likely building their nests underground. And then as some of these angiosperms started to evolve to exhale more water vapor, put out more water vapor from their leaves, the data shows that things got wetter, we got more rainforest-like forests. And during that time, in these wetter environments, the ants seem to have moved out from underground, or many ants, out from underground into the trees. Hmm. That that's the phylogenetic bracketing suggests. They also made the note that other groups also are noted to move more into arboreal lifestyles, into tree living lifestyles. Uh, frogs, snakes, and other plants like bromeliads and air plants are noted during this time making similar transitions. And then as time went on, the flowering plants start to move out from the forests into more arid regions and we see the ants follow them into those more arid regions. Mm. And one of the things they note with that transition is that many ant, many plants in these environments start to form structures called eleosomes, which are seeds with like food packets on them. Hmm. Like specifically separate nutritional nuggets connected right. to the seed. Here is some food that is outside of the seed uh, for hungry mouths that want to eat it. Yes, please take this seed back to your nest and disperse it and enjoy the food, not the seed. Yes. They note a rise in these kinds of structures in plants during this time, which could mean that the plants were evolving alongside the ants to entice ants to stay with them, basically. Mm -hmm. That that connection was already there. Yeah. Or that the ants were following the plants, and it was beneficial for the plants to have contingency plans alongside the seeds. Yes. For the ants that were going after them. Exactly. And so this does not overturn or majorly change our view of the connection between ants and plants, but it gives kind of a story showing the, the pattern and the sequence of events that this research indicates was likely happening and really drives home how strong that connection is mm -hmm. and the intensity of it. They also noted that this can be very important nowadays as we're seeing climactic shifts to help us predict what shifts we might see with plants and ants and other animals relying on them as things change. We've talked about studies like this before, where we'll look at the modern diversity of a group, look at our understanding of their evolutionary tree, calibrate when certain things happened with fossil data, and then go through and point out, all right, this change seemed to happen here, and this change seemed to happen here. The super cool thing when you get examples of tight co-evolution is you can take that data for two different groups mm -hmm. and put them next to each other or superimposed on each other and go, this change in this group happens at the same time as this change in this group. Yes. And these two changes line up. And in the case of insects and plants, those tend to be very tightly correlated because of how closely knit those relationships are ecologically. Yes, exactly. It makes for a very cool evolutionary story, but also just very cool data visualization like i don't know this might not be true for all of our listeners listening but as you're describing it in my head i'm picturing those evolutionary trees and where things line up on them mm -hmm. it could make for some very cool informational graphics for example absolutely well i have a second piece of news that 
like your last bit of news, also has basically nothing to do with the bit of news before it. This is research about dinosaur eggs. Ooh. Research specifically by Mattia Taliavento et al. in PNAS, and we will link to an article in Live Science by Sasha Pear. The dinosaurs in question are Troodon. Troodon is a small predatory dinosaur, uh, somewhat like Velociraptor. Pretty famous, pretty well-known, pretty long-studied. In this study, they are not looking at the Troodon themselves, but eggshells. Eggs. Specifically, fragmentary eggshells that were collected from southern Alberta from the late Cretaceous around 75 million years ago. We've talked before about studies on dinosaur eggs being used to interpret things about dinosaur reproductive biology. In this case, they're doing a technique that we have talked about before, studying the mineral composition of the eggs to understand things about their formation, how they were being formed, and in this case specifically the conditions of their formation, which can tell us things about the dinosaurs because the eggs are being formed in the bodies of those dinosaurs. Neat. The technique they used specifically is called, for those of you who like terminology, dual clumped isotope thermometry. Basically means looking at the isotopic signature, so the mineral chemical signature in the eggs, to interpret conditions of formation, especially temperature. Yes. Because mineral formation is just chemistry, and you'll recall from chemistry class, chemistry is often extremely temperature dependent. So the mineral content and structure of an eggshell is going to vary in certain ways depending on the temperature at which the eggshell formed. And again, because eggs form in bodies, that gives us an idea of the temperature of the body that made the egg. In this case, they looked at a handful of these eggshells and identified among their specimens two different temperatures of formation. 42 degrees Celsius, or 107 Fahrenheit, and 29 degrees Celsius, or 84 Fahrenheit, which are two distinctly different temperatures to interpret for the body of the animal that made these eggs. Yeah, that, that's a, a major fluctuation if you're just bouncing between those that's two. That's quite a lot. They noted that both temperatures have previously been reported for Troodon in similar studies, oh. which suggests that they were able to maintain high body temperatures, like endothermy, like birds and mammals do today, but might have been variable or heterothermic, able to lower their body temperature at times when it was beneficial. There are modern birds that do this, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. will have a high body temperature, but in certain circumstances, they can drop their body temperature down. These temperatures from the eggs support those previous findings that Troodon might have been warm-bodied, but able to vary that temperature between multiple different states. Also, having warm body temperatures, they noted, also supports the notion that they could have incubated their eggs. Yeah. Like we have evidence for for other dinosaurs. The other thing that they looked at is evidence for the timing of egg laying. Hmm. So they compared with modern birds and reptiles who have differences in the timing of egg development. Birds have one functional ovary, but they produce and lay eggs very quickly. Mm -hmm. Some birds can produce and lay an egg within a day. Yeah. Whereas reptiles tend to have two functioning ovaries, but they actually produce and lay eggs much more slowly. They note that for many reptiles, it can take one to two weeks to produce that eggshell and prepare the egg to be laid. Ow. These different patterns also leave differences in the mineral composition of the eggshell, and here what they found is that the troodon eggs matched the reptile-like pattern. Huh. That they had those warmer body temperatures, but were producing eggs more like modern reptiles with slower development. They noted that this probably means they had two ovaries, that the faster development might be a thing that birds have developed to make up for that loss of one functional ovary, but also they were then able to estimate how many eggs a troodon might be able to lay. Ooh. They said, given the slow development, and based on the size of the eggs and the size of the troodon themselves, like how, many, how much room is there in the body, these researchers estimated that an individual troodon would probably lay four to six eggs per season. Yeah. So in the, the laying season, your clutch would be four to six eggs. 
which is a very cool thing to be able to estimate, and even more intriguing given that Troodon egg clutches in nests tend to have over 20 eggs. Yeah. Which is way more than this evidence at least seems to suggest they would have been able to lay. So these authors point to other previous suggestions that have proposed that Troodon might have been sharing nests. Yep, yep, yep. You might have had multiple individuals laying eggs in the same nest and then potentially tending those nests together. This is another thing we see in birds today. Uh, mm-hmm. Apparently ostriches will do this. Oh, neat. Yeah, Where they yeah, will yeah. lay eggs in the same nest. They have a communal nest and then are tending for eggs together. So a lot of these interpretations are already adding to previous suggested hypotheses, here contributing some more isotopic mineral composition evidence to refine our understanding of Troodon body temperature and also help us to estimate their patterns of egg production and egg laying. Very cool. It is delightful how many cascading partial and and potential conclusions came from this one study of the the egg formation, uh, which is very cool. And it makes sense because, yeah, you're going to have to touch on things like the biology of the parent Mm -hmm. if you're wanting to know how they formed these eggs. Well, and, and chemical studies like this are always fun because it starts in one place. Like when I saw the headline of the Life Science article and it was like, oh, evidence suggests that these dinosaurs shared their nests. And I thought that's pretty cool. And I started reading through the abstract and through the the discussion and through the article. And it starts off with, well, we did isotope studies to determine the temperature and rate of formation of the eggs. And I said, that's not what that headline said. How are we going to get from here to there? And then it's a little journey where (laughs) we go, oh, I see. That's how, because that rate of formation tells us something about how many eggs it was able to lay and then we compare that with evidence we have from the nest that's a very cool it becomes a very cool logic puzzle well it's like um how the the episodes of uh, of carl sagan's cosmos was often set up <laughs> of like we're going to talk about this topic and by the end of the episode we're going to be discussing something about ancient rome yes <laughs> that seems utterly unconnected but it is it, it very much has that feeling the the clutch size is one that i would not have ever seen coming but makes so much sense and is very intriguing. The The communal nest is neat, uh, especially the comparison with ostriches, which are also ground nesting, mm-hmm. also lay fewer eggs than your average bird. Yes. Like, makes a lot of sense if you were seeing similar behaviors, which is very, very interesting. Now, it's that's a, that's a whole new potential insight into the social behavioral lifestyle of Troodons. Like, yeah. That's very cool. Neat. Well, my next bit of news is, also a study on shells, also dealing with temperature, but not eggshells, snail shells. Oh, that's totally different. Yep. <laughs> These are some snail shell fragments found in a cave that seem to have been potentially cooked. Hmm. This research is by Marine Wojciechowski et al. in Quaternary Science Reviews, and the article is by Will Sullivan in Smithsonian Magazine. This research was looking at some snail shell fragments from Border Cave which is in southern Africa. It's a rock shelter on a cliff about 2,000 feet above sea level, and in these date to somewhere between 170 and 70,000 years old. The shell fragments are interesting because their colors differ from brown to beige all the way to matte gray. Hmm. And that color variation could indicate that the shells had been heated and had chemically changed the color structure of the shell, which could perhaps be signs of cooking. So the experiment they ran was to get some modern giant snail shells. The one they used is the brown-lipped agate snail, which is likely from the same group these old shells came from, same snail group of large land snail. And then they cooked them in a muffle furnace, which I don't know what that is. Oh, probably a hot one. From temperatures of 200 to 550 degrees Celsius, or 392 to 1,022 degrees Fahrenheit. Told you. Between periods ranging from 5 minutes to 36 hours. Wow. So just all sorts of variables. Yep. To get a huge range of cooking experiences. Right. What, what does it look like when we cook these shells in all these different conditions? And then they studied the color change, weight loss, and shattering 
patterns of the shells after being heated. They investigated it using infrared and Raman spectroscopy, as well as scanning electron mic- microscopy for some of the shells. So looking at the physical, super, super tiny physical changes, but also chemical changes. Exactly. And they were wanting to identify the heat-induced transformation as opposed to any taphonomic you know, fossil, just age-related changes that might have happened to the shells. And they found the heating they did caused the same kind of color changes in many of the shells, as well as tiny cracks also seen in the older shells. Hmm. So it seems like the same pattern was produced to match these old shells. So it does seem like those were indeed heated. Now, this doesn't definitely mean they were cooked. They could have just been left near a fire or in a fire. Like, there could have been other reasons they got heated. But other evidence from the cave does suggest food use for this cave. They do find other things nearby, like charred seeds and animal bones. That seems like they there was purposeful heating of food in this cave, so that lends support which led the researchers to conclude that the most likely scenario was that these shells were indeed cooked by ancient humans and were specifically brought to this cave for that purpose. And from what they can tell, means that humans started eating snails, at least here at this cave, about 170,000 years ago, and then increased in intensity of eating of snails somewhere between 160,000 to 70,000 years ago during that time, that we started eating more snails which makes Border Cave the earliest evidence of humans eating snails, Hmm. which is notable because past evidence had the earliest signs of this at 49,000 in Africa and 36,000 in Europe. And the prior thinking was that humans hadn't, didn't start to eat things like snails and these smaller types of food animals until toward the end of the last ice age. So this is much earlier than we would have expected this food source to be included in a human diet, which isn't incredibly surprising because snails are actually a really good source of food. Like people eat them today. And they're pretty common. They're pretty common. Uh, They are sources of important nutrients. They noted uh, iron and potassium, calcium, and omega-3 fatty acids. They also noted that they would be useful for certain groups of humans, like young children and elderly, who might have trouble chewing harder foods. Oh, sure. So that it might... Something nice and soft. That gives them those important nutrients, but is an easy-to-eat meal. Right. Slimy yet satisfying. Mm Mm-hmm. And this thinking of, like, a family group or, or collection of people is supported by other evidence at the cave. Previous studies have noted things like charred or roasted plant material as well as the seeds and bones noted earlier, there's now multiple layers of evidence with the addition of these snail cells that Border Cave was used as what they called a home base, you know, a, a place to gather and bring food specifically for cooking hmm. and potentially then you know, distribution among a group, but that food was being brought to this site specifically to be cooked and prepared for eating, which makes it a important site for interpreting ancient human lifestyle mm-hmm. and and behaviors. Studies like this are often fun because they involve people trying to replicate what happened to the thing that they're studying. It's interesting that they use heat uh, to create those similar patterns of deformation, especially because so many actualistic studies of fossilization also use heat. Yes. And I do wonder how much overlap there is between the changes that are brought on by cooking it in a fire and the changes that are brought on just over time. Yeah. Since intense heat in long periods of time is also what we use to simulate the fossilization process. So I'd be very interested to see uh, in the future if, if there is other supporting evidence in this cave that the, these snails were being used as food items. It'd be super cool to find like coprolites mm-hmm, with mm-hmm, bits mm-hmm. of snail shell in them to sort of refine that concept that these were in fact being cooked here, it would not surprise me. I'm I'm always a little bit, you know, I'm not not an expert on ancient human activities (laughs) or anything, but every now and then there'll be a study like this where people will say, well, we didn't have evidence of humans eating this thing before that, or it wasn't considered 
uh, likely or, or certain that they were eating this thing. And it's always cool to get evidence that ancient humans were eating other stuff. And I'm never surprised by it. Yeah. It never surprises. I, uh, it, it makes total sense to me that humans would be eating snails. Yeah. I assume, perhaps completely wrongheadedly, that once our lineage discovered that if you put animal and plant stuff in a fire, it becomes better to eat, that they just started putting everything in the fire. Right. Because that feels like what we would do. Well, it's, it's feels what like what we, we would do, do now. today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What else can we deep fry and make it taste this way or do this thing? So it's it, not at all surprising that humans might have been eating a whole variety of things back at that time. Absolutely. Well, and, and Especially if you had a home base and you're like, mm-hmm. Quit, go out into the woods and find something else for us to cook. Well, I mean, I, I, I would absolutely believe it's just like, well, I was walking through the woods whilst like the grown-ups were doing important stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I gathered up a whole bunch of stuff, put them next to the fire and waited to see which ones started to smell good. Sure. Like, yeah. You don't like, who knows? <laughs> uh, and I definitely have those moments as well with y- human studies of just like our behavior is so all over the place mm-hmm. and can change so quickly as we learn new things and are teaching, you know, each other both within a family group, but like within societies. Mm hmm new things so that it is very there's always a part of me that hesitates when I, when like you making the point of like we didn't think humans were doing this until then and i'm like yeah but probably somewhere someone was mm-hmm. some random village on some random piece of land was like yeah but we figured that out the rest of humans haven't but we did so this kind of study i, I always have that conflicting reaction of on the one hand extreme caution of interpreting limited remains mm-hmm. to have been utilized in a very specific fashion. It's like, all right, there's, there are, there's always uncertainties, especially with archeological stuff and yeah. tool use and how humans were using things. We want to be aware of drawing <laughs> disproportionate conclusions. Right. So are we, are we, how sure can we be that these were cooked and let's, let's be cautious. But then on the other hand being not, I'm not at all surprised. And if it would, if it turned out that these weren't cooked and eaten by humans, I would still believe that people were cooking and eating snails back exactly. then until, you know, the next evidence comes out of it. Yep. Evidence shows humans were eating snails. Yeah, probably. Excellent. Great. <laughs> very cool stuff. It's, it's neat. I also like these studies just because of the uh, approach. It's very similar to, you know, studies of medieval and, you know, more recent archeological studies of, we found this thing and we're not 100% sure. So we built our own in the backyard to see what it did once we put yes. it together. <laughs> yep. Because <laughs> that, that's the only way to figure out exactly how well the catapult that you see in the picture was doing is to build your own and then fire a catapult. Yes. <laughs> they just had to cook some snails. And with that, we can wrap up our news section and move into the main discussion after a short break and discuss what are claws and how do we define these finger structures. Stay tuned. So today we're talking about claws. And claws are something we all, many of us encounter on a regular basis, especially if you have a pet. These are the often long curve pointed structures at the end of fingers and toes. Quick question, what's the first example of a claw that comes to mind when you hear claw? I'm for me, uh, I am heavily biased that uh about a foot away from me mm-hmm. is an animal that is covered in them. Yep. Uh cat claws, uh cats cat and dog claws I think of side by side because they're both claws and they're used in very different ways. Yes. Uh in very interesting comparisons. Cat claw is one of the kind of default claw examples and was definitely the thing that came up most often as a picture when I was trying to find mm-hmm. claw examples just during my searches. Uh, cat claws come up for me. I think I think of uh, bird talons. Sure. A whole bunch. That, for some reason, that's a very distinctive claw. Claws take all sorts of different shapes and sizes, but the term claw is also one that is used much more widely than just these examples. There are many quote-unquote claw-shaped things in nature. Tons of examples of 
long or at least curved hooked structures found in life. Probably the first thing that comes to mind when we say claw other than these kinds of finger claws is like a crab claw. Mm -hmm. Crab claws or scorpion claws, those pincers are often called claws. The scientific term that's used for these structures is chelicera. These are often called claws, but are wholly different structures, pretty obviously. it's That's more the hand of that animal than the end of their digits. You will, though, see other claw-like structures on other arthropods. Many insects, many spiders have claws on the end of their limbs. Mm-hmm. These are often called tarsal claws, which is at the end of the tarsus. These are sometimes paired, sometimes more complicated structures that are used for hooking onto the environment, hooking onto other animals, you know, for either mating purposes or grabbing for feeding. These are extremely claw shaped. Like, yeah, they look, there's a reason they're called claws. Yep. They look just like the claws you expect on like a cat or a bear or something. Absolutely. If you zoom in on a spider claw, it, and I had a zoomed in like electron microscope picture of a cat claw, <laughs> you might have trouble telling me which one goes to which animal without the rest of the organism. These are super interesting, super complex. They are extremely varied in their shape and structure. Many of them incorporate metal into their exoskeleton to strengthen these body parts, but these don't actually qualify as what we would call true claws. Right. There is also at least one plant that I know that there might be multiple species of this, but the cat claw vine, which has a gripping structure that has a three-pronged clawed set of hooks to grip onto rock surfaces and other plants. Sure. Which is super cool. I couldn't find any research on those claws because the plant is used medicinally. Uh, uh, so all the research that you look up... All the research is about us. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Nothing. Not even the Wikipedia page was like, also they have claws. <laughs> but there are clawed, quote-unquote, plants. This is similar to the discussion we had in episode 151 about tails. Yes. But there are things that are technically true tails, and then there are things that are tail-like mm -hmm. that we often call tails, but are a very different structure and thus hard to discuss in the same conversation, in the same context. Exactly. That It's just like with horns, that you have mm -hmm. like the horned beetles that have horn-like structures and are using them in very similar ways to horned animals, but it's different thing. It's a different structure. When we talk about true claws, those are... The ones that you'll find on your birds, your reptiles, your mammals. You will find still claw-like structures on many of these as well. Spurs on the feet of birds. The little spikes that are on the ankle area of like chickens and stuff are not actually claws. That's a bony spur coming out from the leg bone that's making a spike but is not actually a claw. It's just another spiky structure separate. It's its own thing. So you will still see weird claw-ish things on actually true clawed animals. So it can get very easy for the term claw to be used in confusing anatomical situations. Right. Well, and it's a term that you, you say claw and people know what you're talking yeah. about and you can point at a spider and you can point at whatever and say claw. But if we want to get scientific about it, we have to start specifying our definitions. True claws are multi-part organs at the end of digits. So these are things found in vertebrates, so us bony animals. They consist of the last bony portion of a finger or toe, so the last phalange, and a keratinized structure off of that bone. Keratin, as many of us are familiar with, is the same structure as our fingernails, which we will be talking about this episode, and hair rhino horns, it's that hard, not quite bony structure that you'll find in many animals. That is the outer sheath of a claw, and then the last bony section of a digit is the internal structure of a claw. Right. This is, it's very similar to when we talked about horns. Yes. In episode 140, that true horns are a bony core with a keratin sheath over the outside of it. And you will often hear referring to the horny portion of the claw because it is made out of very similar structures and similar 
molecules as actual horn keratin Mm -hmm. and is a very similar grown structure. By this definition, this includes claws, our fingernails, and things like hooves. Oh, yeah. Those all are the same general structure that are just taking different shapes and, you know, different chemical structures depending on the organism making them, but that those are all basically the same thing. So claw is really a... It's more of a shape. It's more of a shape. Yeah. The structure that we are referring to, the general term for these structures is unglies. And there's various terms for the different shapes that you'll see. Right. So uh, for a little bit of etymological background, each of the bones in a digit, uh, those are the phalanges. Mm -hmm. Each one is a phalanx. The last one is the ungual. It's the ungual. The ungual bone. So an ungual claw is the claw that is on that ungual. The unguis is that keratin covering that takes a variety of shape. So your claws, hooves, those are your unguis. Yes. And it will often refer to when these terms are used, both the keratin and that ungual bone. Because right. the like, sh- like a horn. Exactly. Often we're just talking about both parts. Yeah, you can't really discuss one without the other, you know, unless you don't have one of them. Sure, sure. Uh, which we will discuss. Mm-hmm. Because they are connected in their anatomy and shape and morphology. So let's go through the anatomy of a claw really quick. The keratin sheath, which is made out of more than just keratin. You will often hear it called keratinized, but a term that will often come up as well is cornified or cornification because there are other things than keratin in many claws and nails and hoofs. It is not just keratins or keratinocytes, but that is the most famous and and often discussed material within the the claw. You'll find different kinds. You know, birds and reptiles have beta keratins, which are often harder than the alpha keratins that are found in us mammals. So you'll find differing chemical structures These keratin sheaths are typically ever-growing, like our fingernails are, Mm -hmm. and are maintained through abrasion, you know, just wear and tear with use and in the environment. This is often what helps give the nail part of its shape in that it will wear in specific ways and maintain the shape or tip that it needs to. You do have specialized versions of that. Cat claws are famous for this in that when you think of, like, sharpening your nails wear it like you would sharpen a sword when a cat is doing that on something they're not actually wearing the claw away they are pulling off the outer layer of the keratin right their claw is coming in layers kind of working like croc teeth yes but there's another tooth coming up underneath and you get rid of that old top one and the truth is that all claws are made out of layers of keratin Mm -hmm. cat claws though those layers split in a very specific way So that when the top layer sheds off, it pulls away from a nice new sharpened layer underneath. Right. This is why if you're a cat owner, you will tend to find those little claw sheaths Mm -hmm. around on the carpets and stuff where they've popped off. This is a common feature among cats, both domestic and large cats. It is also, though, found among some small dogs that will do this. And even certain horse hooves are known to shed the outer layer of the hoof. Oh, cool. So this is not the only unguis to do this. The outer portion of the claw is made out of this keratin, and it will often be wrapped around the ungual, and sometimes all the way around like an ice cream cone, other times in a curved upper section that wraps around the top and sides, depends on the group you're talking about. The In those examples where you have it curving around the top and sides, you'll have an empty in section very often, which will be filled with a material that is also cornified called subunguis or the sole pad or the sole horn or the sole plate. This is the stuff that makes up the underside of your fingernail. That slightly mm-hmm. different, not quite nail material, but not quite skin material. That is that same stuff. Uh, For us, it doesn't fill in the entire underside. It's just at the border between nail and fingertip. Right. In an us, we call it the hyponychium. And so, once again, if you think of dog claws are the one I always think of as an example of this. When you look at the underside of their claw, there is a different material that's not the same as the claw. It's a different, still tough stuff underneath there. Right. Because when you think of, like, a bird talon... 
that is a cone around that bone mm-hmm. at the end of the toe. The dog claw is partially surrounding that bone. And our claw, as it is, mm-hmm. our fingernails, are mostly sitting on top. Yes. So if you think of a dog or cat claw as kind of like a fingernail that has wrapped around the fingertip, it's gone down the sides and curved outward into a structure. Now, all these different shapes actually do have different names. Since they are all basically the same structure, the shapes have been given different names. Falculae is the term given for claw-shaped unguis. When you have long curved or more long, more curved structures, we call these falculae. And we see a similar shape in the phalanges within the claw. Nails are called ungulae. And so whenever you have a more flattened nail-like structure, it'll often be called ungulae. Cool, like ours. Yep. You do get weird stuff like tegulae, which are claw-shaped nails. Hmm. Which are basically a nail like I was describing with cat claws, but that is actually a nail that has been folded up like a taco and stretched out into a claw-like shape. Sure. But is likely ancestrally different from falculae. Right. Which is, were originally shaped this, that this way. started as a nail and then became claw-shaped. Yes. Sure. So there's, there's back and forth. Yeah. We do see this in a lot of, when you think of clawed primates, a lot of those are probably actually tegulae and not actual claws. But we will talk more about that later on. Sure. So this is arriving at the claw shape in multiple different ways. Yes. Mm. And then, of course, you have things like hooves. Sure. Which is hoofule. Hoofule. I, yeah, I didn't find any like term <laughs> uh, for for hoofs specifically. Yeah. Well, but... then we are we are coining <laughs> yep, it here yep. on the podcast. Hoofule. <laughs> These are specific to ungulates. These are those structures that cover the tip of the digits and are used for walking on. Right. Which we see in horses and giraffes and things like that. Yep. Yep. Incidentally, to continue our etymological adventure. That's why they're called ungulates. Yep. Because they are walking on the ungual bone, which has that unguous hoof at the end of it. There's a lot of ung that goes on uh, with that whole group of animals. Lots of ungen. Now, these terms can be useful for general description, but there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of vagueness as to when you're in between a Falculae and ungulae, when you're in between a claw and a nail, what do you call it? Mm -hmm. When you're a little bit more claw-shaped nail, what do you... How often do we just call the tegulae claws? Because that's what it's being used as. Yeah. The terms are used kind of loosely very often. You will often hear it called a claw in one situation, but then specified a tegulae in another. Or you might not hear those three terms come up at all. and they don't really help when we're trying to cover the incredible diversity of these structures across animals. These are found in basically every single amniote group, so the groups descended from our egg-laying, our hard-shelled egg-laying ancestors. So this includes reptiles, mammals, and birds today. Every major group and the vast majority of members have some sort of claw-like structure You do have situations where they've lost them, like whales have lost their nails and claws. Mm -hmm. There is also the one interesting example of marsupial hallux, their big toe on their foot, has no nail, has no claw structure. Hmm. There's not even a nail bed. Just that one, just that one toe. Yep. Just a fleshy toe. All right. (laughs) That is clawless. We mentioned already that some claws will wrap more around the top of the tip of the digit, but then things like crocodile claws just fit over the claw bone completely as an entire cone. Like when you're a kid and you put bugles on the end of your fingers. Yes. Bugles are a type of chip for everybody (laughs) who lives in a place where you don't have those. They are a cone-shaped chip. Yep, yep. Chips are crisps for people uh, (laughs) who are not familiar with the lingo. This is a terminology-heavy episode. Google Bugles the brand. Other snack foods are available. We are not in any sort of sponsorship deal with Beatles. Now, while the shape of all these different nails and claws, we it is impossible to make categories for all of them. We do find trends. The most common trend is that the shape of the claw matches what it's being used for. Yes. The functional morphology is very consistent with claws. Yep. One study I found 
looking at the morphology of claws and grouping them into general lifestyle things of like terrestrial, arboreal, so on and so forth, mm-hmm. we're able to classify with confidence 81% and accounting for some more data, 96% of claws into these lifestyles. Right. So you look at the shape of a claw yep. and most of the time you can go, yeah, this thing lives in a tree. And this goes for the outer keratin, but also the bone inside is shaped to fit the claw on the outside. So mm-hmm. like crocodile toe bones are shaped like the outside claw very much so. And so you can study the shape of the bone and the shape of the keratin, and both can give you this important information. As one study put it, this is where the animal meets the road. That mm-hmm. Claws, nails, so on, are where the animal often is directly in interacting with their ecosystem and environment, or other organisms potentially. So they are incredibly important for the evolutionary success of these different groups. There are a million different examples we could go through, but you you do see general trends of like short and stout unguis tend to go with terrestrial habitats and ground-dwelling lifestyles. Walking around and having more sturdy, you know, nails is very common. You will see more hooked or longer nails for climbing organisms that are needing gription onto surfaces. So if you think of like, you know, squirrel claws that have those little hooked Mm-hmm. Sharp claws for climbing up trees. You, of course, will see similar shapes in a lot of predatory animals that are using their hooked sharp claws to grip into flesh sure. and grab prey. You'll often see more narrow, sharp, smaller claws in things that are using their hands, like raccoons, which do climb, but they're also using their digits for nimble work. And so they are going to have smaller claws that aren't going to get in the way of that. Right. A little bit more finger pad available. There's famous things like moles with their giant shovel claws. Mm -hmm. Armadillos and anteaters that have similar giant claws for digging, but also tearing into often insect mounds and insect nests. There's also plenty of evidence that those claws are defensive as well. So you'll see them used secondarily for stuff. The list goes on and on and on. And many of these are very easy wide descriptions that you can make of like, yep, that's a flat claw that's good for digging. That's a flat claw that's good for walking on. That's a sharp one that's good for climbing. That's a sharp one that's good for catching stuff. But you can even get really specific. Like when you actually study the shapes of the claws, you can separate animals within the same group into different specialized lifestyles. I found one study that was looking at uh, monitor lizards and the shapes of their claws, and were able to group them into the substrates they were specialized in walking on. Oh, cool. Just based on claw shape. So close within the same genus, they were able to say, no, no, you are better at climbing trees. You are better at climbing rocks. Because of your claw shape, we can tell that, and it parsed out accurately based on the known behavior of those groups. They were even able to note the ones that were a little bit better at digging. So like, even with groups that have what at a glance would look like very similar claws and are all big, long lizards, you can actually get very, very detailed information based on their claw shape. So claws are highly, highly connected to the way they are being used. And those trends are also true for all those things we mentioned that are claws but not claws. Mm -hmm. Like Similar functional morphology, that similar relationship between the shape and the function is also seen even in the stuff like the insect claws and the spider claws, because that's such an integral piece of what those structures are for. Absolutely. Like, I know there's been studies that have used structures like that to identify specific group or even species of arthropods, Mm -hmm. because we have this section and this claw is so distinct that we should be in this group. You will also see cool things about, like, animals using it differently throughout life. Tree sloths where as babies, they're using their long curved claws to hang on to mom. Mm-hmm. But then as they grow, they get longer and a bit more curved to hang on to branches. Yeah. So you will see different uses throughout life. And as they change ontogenetically in the growth of individual animals. One study though that I had to mention, because this is one of my favorite examples of claw use and morphology, is how raptors, birds of prey, use their claws and have different shaped talons for the different ways they hunt and catch their prey. Raptors include your hawks, your eagles, your falcons, your owls, and fishing birds like osprey. 
They are famous for having long, sharp claws on their feet, often called talons, just because that's the term that's been used for bird claws. It is often uh, misinterpreted that they use those as their killing tool, but very often that is the main purpose of the talon is to immobilize, grab and hold the prey, and then it will be dispatched by the beak. Right. And the immobilization strategies that we see depend on size of prey. You know, different size preys are handled differently. Small ones can be grabbed by the foot. Bigger ones may have to be pinned down by the weight of the animal. Mm -hmm. But also, the shape of the claws change based on the kinds of prey and immobilization strategies each group is using. When we look at the Axipitridae, hawks and kites and eagles, we note on their first and second digits, which if you're looking at a bird foot with the back toe and the front three toes, this would be the back toe and the inner toe, they have notably larger claws on those two digits. And then the other two claws are still sharp, but not nearly as big. So big hooked claws on the back toe and inner toe, and those claws are noted to be focused on while they immobilize their prey. They'll use those claws specifically, and they're specialized for restraining larger prey. Mm -hmm. So they have these hooked claws specifically for that. The falconidae, which are your falcons, typically a bit smaller, have more equal-sized talons on their toes, only slightly larger on those two toes, and they're not nearly as large and hooked as our other group. They will still use their talons for immobilization, but they rely on a quick kill bite instead. So we see less emphasis on the talons because they have a hooked beak with a notch for like severing spinal cords. Mm -hmm. So falcons are in for the quick kill bite. They don't need as much immobilization strength. So we see less prominent claws. The Pendionidae, which include things like osprey, a lot of your fishing raptors, they tend to have large hooked claws on all digits, but that's because they are fish specialists. So these are hooked for grabbing onto slippery prey. And you will see convergent adaptations in fishing eagles. Mm. That they have similar talon structure, divergent from other eagles with just right. the two. But similar to ospreys yeah. for grabbing fish. Exactly. And then probably the weirdest one is owls, unsurprisingly, your strigiforms. They have less curve, but still very long talons, but high grip strength. And so they are specialized for a very small prey that they are crushing in their foot, but they're not needing those extremely hooked talons to hold on to more powerful struggling, struggling prey. Right. They don't need to grip it with the talon quite as much. They can just get it in the fingers. And so the talons have specialized along with that grip strength to increase its effectiveness, but not needing the hookingness. Yeah. And so you can see whole suites of characters, characteristics in claws, even within closely related groups, very much driven by how they're being used. Yeah. Even if they're using them in very similar ways. Yeah. Like you wouldn't immediately look at all those different birds and think, think that they must have talons that are shaped and functioning differently. Yeah, they're all picking up food with their feet. Right. But those slight differences in how they're using them and what they're going after translate to differences in the shapes of those claws. Yeah. And like, we will try to find pictures. When you see like the foot of a hawk, those enlarged claws are notably enlarged. Like they are yeah. big. Those are big, scary claws. And they're only really on those two toes. It is a very specific foot pattern and claw pattern. Throughout this conversation, I've been trying to think of what are some of my favorite examples of claws, and I realized that the best animals don't have claws. <laughs> you mentioned some animals have lost claws, and that yep. is true. Some animals have done away with the whole apparatus. I was like, snakes don't have claws. But then I remembered mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that in boas and pythons, they do have that spur. Yep. And I don't know that you would technically call that a claw, because it, they have remnants of the bones in the back limbs, these just little dinky remnants, with that a keratin, I believe it is very much the same sort of keratin sheath over the outside of it that protrudes outside the body and the males will use to scrape at each other. And I don't know if that would technically be a claw because I don't know if it's technically over the ungual bone. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And as I don't know if we know what bone that's over. Right. Because I don't know if the bones in... The remnant limbs of bows and pythons are confidently identified to what bones they are. Yep, yep, yeah. <laughs> that I'm not sure. But they at least have a claw-ish thing 
sticking out on either side of the cloaca. Well, and those are often called pelvic spurs, mm -hmm. which goes back to the spurs on like chickens that that, that term yes. is used for claw like structures all the time. And yeah, I, I guess it would really depend on is this the end of the digit and potentially uh, it could be a re-evolution of a claw like structure. Right. You know, they could have lost their claw and then still needed to toughen up the tip of this nub. Right. And added keratin to it. So yeah, it's so, snake claws, kind of. This could be the remnants of their ancestral claw, or it could be a re-evolution of a claw-like thing. Right. Very interesting. <laughs> Speaking of weird examples of claws, there are amphibian claws. Okay. So like you said before, we're mostly talking about reptiles, and, uh, mammals, birds, and then other weird invertebrates that have done kind of yes. maybe similar stuff that is technically different. Amphibians, Liz Amphibia, which include our frogs and salamanders. And, and Sicilians. And Sicilians. The whole episode about them. They also don't have claws. They do not. They do not. <laughs> this group typically does not have claw-like structures, mostly because their epidermis, their skin, is not very cornified. There's not a lot of keratin going on. Right. In those other groups, we are full of keratin. Our hair is keratinized stuff. Scales are keratinized, feathers are keratinized. Right. So the skin in those groups is full of keratin to produce claw-like structures. Sure. And our skin tends to be relatively tough mm -hmm. compared to amphibians, which also have often have very thin, very permeable skin. So it is not common that we see horny structures, cornified structures, keratinized structures in amphibians, just period. But there are examples, and they do qualify as true claws. There's not many. There are clawed salamanders, just one genus, two species that I, I found. The genus Onycodactylus, which have claws on both their front and hind limbs on their digits. These are typically very simplified claws, not super complicated in their shape, just little kind of pin caps on the end of the digit that is, though, keratinized sheath that sits on the end of that last bone. There is a Cyrenian salamander, Pseudobranchus, that though they lack hind limbs, do have claws on all four digits of their forelimbs. Weird. Yeah. So sirens are, are uh, swimmers. They're very yep. powerful swimmers. And yeah, they've lost their back legs. They're the mermaid salamanders. Yes. <laughs> but they have clawed front limbs. That's cool. Yeah. This, at least this one, this gotcha. one yes. species. This one species. Yep. So like, even when we have examples, it's usually not like this group. It's like, no, no. Right. These two species within this group, this one species within this group. In the neurons, the frogs, the pipids are the only ones known. Mm -hmm. There's two genera, Xenopus and Hymenochirus. Xenopus, I've heard of. Yes. That's the African clawed frog. The African clawed frog. The other one is the African dwarf frog. These are very closely related. Okay. And they both have their claws on the back feet on the first three digits. So the inner three toes. Gotcha. So kind of like we pointed out marsupials being weird for having that one toe without a claw on it. For these, they only have claws on certain toes. Yes. And we do see that in other groups. Crocs famously uh, tend to only have claws on those inner toes as well. The last toe on their back foot doesn't have a claw. And I think the last two toes on their front feet, if I remember right, often don't have claws. That's right. That's They're right. Just little, little scaly sausages hanging off. These claws in the clawed frogs have been noted to be used in uh, defense, but also like in kicking and tearing at food. So they, mm. they do seem to be actively used for purposes. So there are truly clawed amphibians. Interesting. Not many. Five modern ones, as we can tell. So a literal handful. Mm -hmm. you, literally, you could probably oh, hold yes. all yep. of these amphibians yep. <laughs> in your hand. Both literal in count <laughs> one, and probably One mass. of each species would probably fit in your hand. So that it, it is very rare in this group. There is one other example, the African hairy frog. Sure. There are two different genera with overall group Arthroleptidae. These genera are Astylosternus and Trichobatrachus. These have very unique toes on their back feet on toes two through five which would be your outer four toes so not including the inner toe everything but the big toe everything but the big toe they have their last digit their last phalange that last bone is very claw shaped okay but there's nothing notable on the outside of the toe no sheath no keratin mm -hmm. covering and only part of the bone is is claw shaped 
the end of the bone is a cap of bone that it connects to that is blunted. These are the frogs that you may have heard of because they're often called like wolverine or horror frogs because what they will do is flex that bone downward, snap it off of that cap, off of the knob at the end, and then puncture the bottom of their toe pads with this sharp bone to expose claw-like bones that they will then use in self-defense. They'll kick. And the reports have said, both due to eyewitness and researcher attestments, inflict bloody wounds. I believe it. And so they will... Shards of bone. Yeah. These sharp pieces of bone, they will kick with them. This is a bone, a claw-like structure. Right. Not technically a claw. Because it's missing that keratin sheath. Right. But it is a claw-shaped ungual on the back feet. And since they don't have that sheath on the outside to sort of accentuate that shape, they have to simply stick the sharp claw of bone through the skin to protrude it so that it can be functional. Which is the only example we see of this in any animals. Absolutely bizarre. So this is a unique example of a claw-like structure, but probably not at all related to those other amphibian claws. Right. This is a different method of, <laughs> a, of attaining the same thing. This is a whole different thing. This is a whole thing that most uh, vertebrate animals have decided not to do. Yep, yep. Which species of frog was that? Again, for our, our listeners who want to Google it. This is the African hairy frog. And is named that because they have long, thin bits of skin on the side of their body that looks like hair that helps them breathe in water. Oh, cool. That expands the surface area of their skin. That's cool. Cool frogs. Very cool. Very weird. And the note of clawed amphibians brings up an important question about claws, which is their origins. Specifically, is this an amniote feature or is this a tetrapod feature right did some early land animals have claws and it was spread through amniotes and some amphibians or was this an amniote feature the egg lay the hard-shelled egg laying feature right. and amphibians mostly missed it yes exactly this is of course tough to answer definitively we do have some evidence that supports this could go back before amniotes, uh, we have plenty of fossil evidence of early amniotes in the Permian Carboniferous area, both synapsids and sauropsids, so both ancestors of mammals and reptiles, having claws. So this mm -hmm. is a very early amniote feature. That's not super surprising. There are some pre-amniotes that do have claw-like structures, it seems. Uh, one example I found was Diadectes, which was a group of reptilomorphs. Not quite reptiles, but close. Yes. So just, just outside. Now, I did see some ambiguity when I looked up their Wikipedia page that they may be within synapsids. So they might... Interesting. Their placement might not be but outside amniotes. An early portion of the amniote group. That could be pre-amniote, might be just within that beginning... There are some examples of very close to the beginning of amniotes or maybe pre-amniote claw structures. Okay. So it could be something that came before the first amniotes. It is very likely thought, though, that reptilian and mammalian claws are shared origin. We have very similar hair-like keratinized structures and keratin chemical makeup that seems like the ancestor to mammals and reptiles likely was the source of this keratin. So those first amniotes probably had these. Yes. And at least that the source of our keratin comes from the same place. It could still be that we came to claws separately, mm -hmm. but likely that the claw-like structures that we have came from a common ancestor. Amphibian claws are where we get potentially mixed messages. The fact that they have true claws could suggest that Going back before amniotes, there was some origin to claws right. that then split into the reptile mammal line and the amphibian line. Right. And it, it modern uh, amphibians are mostly clawless, but modern amphibians are weird anyway. Yes. It could just be that they happen to have mostly lost their claws from their ancestors. Exactly. That, that structure became real popular in mammals and reptiles and just didn't catch on and stick around in amphibians. But there are notes that their structure is different. Mm. 
Amphibian claws are much simpler. They're typically just little cones, like not even often curved, just ice cream cone caps, while mammal and reptile claws are complex. Very, very notable structures and typically more curved shapes. So it could be that this is a simpler remnant of a simpler, more ancestral version, or modern amphibians just evolved that separately. Exactly. Ended up with a simple imitation of the claws we see in those other animals. They also tend to lack the subungues, the underside material mm. of mammal and reptile claws. And when they took a look at Xenopus's claws, they did note that a number of the molecular components were absent in its claws that are found in amniote claws, including the main molecular components of amniote claws. So like the important core ones are completely absent in the African clawed frog, mm. which so far has leaned things toward that these are not similar. These are not originally from the same structure that modern amphibians claws are likely a convergent evolution of true claws, which does lean the evolutionary story of claws toward that they were part of land invasion. That as we move from our pre-amniote, mostly more water-tied ancestors to more land-bound and specialized ancestors, claws became a structure that was useful for moving around on this new substrate. Makes sense. Yep. So that's probably what their origin was, was for traction, gripping surfaces. Right. So claws as we know them probably originated around the same time and for similar reasons as hard-shelled eggs. Exactly. It's like adaptations for better surviving in terrestrial ecosystems. And that then we see the use for claws in other things like grasping and climbing and, and fighting and hunting mm -hmm. coming up later. This also is supported by the fact that claws seem to be derived from the integument of the skin, which makes sense as we moved onto land, we also tend to see more scaly skin show up. Sure. Which provides a ready source of keratin to start creating these sheaths. It is noted that the keratin structure of many claws can also have a scale-like pattern to it. Yeah, that makes sense. It could essentially just be specialized scales. Exactly. Over the tip of the digits. Yep, yep. It is noteworthy that, you know, we see claws in non-scaled animals, mammals. Sure. Yeah, we've got them. <laughs> we've got them. Uh, but we do still have lots of keratin available. And we would have gotten our claws from the same ancestors that reptiles got theirs. Right. So it is very likely that claws are really an amniote feature with some other examples that have popped up in other groups and then claw-like things in lots of groups, which now leads us nicely into discussing ancient examples of claws. So claws in the fossil record, which there's a ton of cool examples. So after the break, let's talk about some of those and how we study ancient claws, because there are some caveats that you have to take into consideration for sure. There are plenty of really cool examples of fossil claws. There's some famous ones. We will look at a few interesting examples and studies into ancient claws and trying to interpret what they were doing. Because as we noted, the shape of a claw gives us a lot of information about how it was being used, but there are some behaviors that we might not have anymore. So it might be hard to connect that. One of the first challenges with studying fossil claws is that 99.999% of the time you lack the keratin sheath. Right, you're just getting the bone. So you are missing half the structure that makes a true claw a true claw. But that bone, very luckily, maintains shapes that match the kind of claw or unguis that would have been on the outside of them. Right. So we can interpret what that shape of the sheath would have been based on the shape of the bone, at least to some degree of confidence. Yes, that even if we don't get an exact idea of what the shape of the sheath would have been, studying that shape of the bones should still find us the same kinds of trends among a group or shapes that being able to study the whole thing would have found. Mm -hmm. We've actually talked about some of these kind of studies recently in just a, a news, was it last episode? I don't remember. The episode before, I think. We talked about uh, research on Manny Raptorin claws, 
which was focusing on the Alvarez sores and the Therizinosaurs, which are the groups that respectively have short little, often single digit arms with one little short, strong spike claw on it. And your Therizinosaurs, bigger dinosaurs that had the long, more sickle shaped claws and finding morphological support for digging in your Alvarez sores using those little rock pick claws and support for plant foraging in Therizinosaurs up until Therizinosaurus, which has such long claws that it probably couldn't use it for much physical exertation because it would have likely damaged them. Right. But there are more famous dinosaur claws. David, can you think of a famous dinosaur claw? Well, Therizinosaurus is the one of the first ones that comes to mind. I would imagine the claw that probably gets the most popular appeal is the one that has been featured on the big screen most <laughs> frequently. What's your favorite dinosaur again? Oh, me? Yep. Oh, yeah, that's true. My favorite dinosaur is Deinonychus, which has claw right there in the name. Yep. <laughs> Dromaeosaurs, which include Deinonychus, Velociraptor, Utah Raptor, is a group famous for a very characteristic foot claw Mm -hmm. on the second digit of their foot, which is because they've lost other digits. So Mm -hmm. the inner toe has a extremely large and often strongly curved, what you'll hear called sickle shaped claw. Yes. This is the claw that you're thinking of uh, the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park. Yep. That claw that they hold upright. And then in the kitchen, they're tapping on the floor of the kitchen that sickle claw. This is the claw bone that Grant in Jurassic Park is carrying around with him. Mm -hmm. That's from that toe. This is characteristic for this group. It is also found in Troodontids, which are thought to be closely related to Dromaeosaurs. Mm -hmm. In the more derived groups, like Deinonychus, Velociraptor, and Utah Raptor, it will be even notably larger. Like, those groups are famous for especially large versions of this claw. The articular facets, basically the bending portions of that toe, allow for hyperextension. They can bend it back very far and v- far back and down. And based off of trackways, it is thought that they did hold it off the ground while walking. Yes, that, that depiction in Jurassic Park is actually accurate as far as we can tell. They could bend that toe all the way back and we will get trackways that show part or all of that toe is missing from the trackway. Yes. Because they're holding it up off the ground. This is why those little baby footprints in Jurassic Park only have two toes. Yes. Because they're holding up their little baby killer claw. And that is often what it will be called is the killer claw. Mm -hmm. Because most hypotheses that you'll come across as for how it was being used relate it to a predatory tool. Yes, which is how Grant describes it Mm -hmm. in Jurassic Park when he's terrifying the child and he talks about them slashing across the gut or the jugular or whatever to use that claw to open up the prey. But the truth is that it is a very difficult thing to interpret the use of this claw because we don't see this kind of claw in almost any other group and none to this extreme. Right. This is a very unique structure compared to particularly what animals we have today. And so we don't have a lot of examples for how this claw for sure can be used. So there are lots of hypotheses about how it might have been used. Probably the most classic that comes to mind is the kicking, like slashing out with the claw. Right, the cassowary the approach. The cassowary approach that you're kicking out either a foot or both feet in a double kick. You know, I've seen both sure. interpreted. The John Woo scenario. Mm-hmm. Where you're leaping and kicking those feet forward or putting one leg out and slashing with a kicking motion Mm -hmm. at the prey animal. But it could also be used for defensive purposes. That's how the cassowary uses its kicks, is to fend off animals from its territory. It's also been shown as potentially a way to hold on to large prey. Mm -hmm. This is the classic image of them leaping on the side of a big iguanodon or, or, or hadrosaur and clinging to the side, hooking in those big claws. Right. Crampons. Yes, exactly. Into the flank of the animal and then being able to slash with the front limbs or bite onto specific areas to Mm -hmm. hopefully dispatch the prey. This is often been likened likened to the way that cats will cling onto the animals they pounce on, like lions. If you watch lions hunting like zebras, they'll jump and grab on. Yep, and then maneuver their face around to bite the specific jugular area that they want or wherever they're going to put their killing bite at. 
There's also been versions that have suggested with that same motion of jumping onto the side that then these claws might have been used to drag down the side of the animal using the body weight to create deep wounds, maybe even kicking while they're there. Some have suggested that maybe they were used for targeted attacks, that these were specialized for hitting specific vital areas, Mm -hmm. hitting the jugular, hitting the trachea. What's been often suggested for the saber teeth of saber cats, that these were precision tools. This has partially been suggested for the fighting dinosaur specimen with the Velociraptor and the Protoceratops that seem to be locked in combat. Right, where that killer claw seems to be at the neck. It seems to be aimed for the necks of the the Protoceratops. Yes. So that could be that they were habitually aiming for those areas with that claw. Mm -hmm. Others, though, have suggested that maybe it was used for digging And used to dig out animals from a burrow and even hook them and drag them out of burrows. Sure, sure. That it was a fishing tool for things underground. I've also heard people suggest it as a climbing tool for like trees. Yeah, just climbing up trees. Yep. Which also is how cats often use their claws. Absolutely. But the hypothesis that it seems has currently... The mm-hmm. most support leaning toward it is this, that this is the one, if you're going the direction I yeah. assume you are, this is the one that has, uh, seems to be gaining the most, if I may, traction. Yes, exactly. In scientific studies. That this was used mainly to pin and restrain prey, likely much smaller prey, right, under the foot with the big claw used as a hook. As holding the, the prey in place. Very similar to what we were describing earlier with modern-day birds of prey. Exactly. And a lot of the studies of modern-day birds have been used to strengthen this hypothesis and directly compare how these claws would be used. Specifically, hawks and eagles have large claws on the same toe that they use to grip and restrain powerful prey. But this hypothesis would lean things toward smaller prey groups, mm-hmm. smaller than the dromaeosaur, whilst a lot of those others were them going after bigger prey that they're slashing into. Right. And we've talked about this before on the podcast, that that a lot of interpretation of dromaeosaurs, of these raptor dinosaurs, is of them hunting large animals in packs, which comes from some very early hypotheses that don't all seem to hold up very well to modern understandings of these animals. and. As we have moved at least partially away from that as sort of the predominant thinking of how they were hunting, we've also moved away from the thinking that those claws were somehow helping them take down large prey, that they may be much more suitable to helping them dispatch small prey. Yes. It's it's a very similar pattern that's happened with the saber teeth of saber tooth cats, mm-hmm. in that when we first looked at these extreme weapons... There seems to have been the the partial thought that these must be super weapons, that right. these must be extreme, you know, the, the buster blade swords of yes. the animal world. <laughs> and therefore, surely they were using them against mega prey. Right. Mammoths and stuff. Absolutely. Why else would you need teeth that long unless you're reaching through the hide of them? And then as we've gone on, we go, actually, these would be most efficient for things smaller than you. And as we've talked about before, the vast majority of predatory animals tend to go after prey that is much smaller than them. Yes. Even famous pack hunting animals like wolves, much of the time, will be going after rabbits and small things that they can easily catch themselves, even if they are also hunting big stuff. Yes, even if that does still happen, small prey is just going to be safer Mm -hmm. and often easier to dispatch because you're bigger than it. That's why bullies function the way they do. (laughs) It's easier if they're smaller than you and not as powerful. Grim. This is often called the raptor prey restraint hypothesis, Mm -hmm. based off of the way raptors hunt. But also there is other support. Uh, There's been studies on the musculoskeletal system of Deinonychus specifically, models set up for what the likely muscular structure would have allowed the claw to do Mm. and what forces it could have produced and found that the forces produced by the tip aren't actually that high. Right. That it doesn't really seem like they were punching through stuff with great force. Slashing across skin. Not likely, which is support that it was used for something other than a killing move, but Mm -hmm. maybe a grasping move, which is further supported by modern birds, the Sariema, the red-legged Sariema specifically, these are famous. These are the uh, ones that the internet have made famous for bouncing golf balls off pavement. Yes, because that's what they do to lizards yep, and stuff. They'll grab prey and slam it on the ground until it is stunned or dead. Yes. 
but they have a recurved ex- a larger claw on the same digit. Mm-hmm. And they're the only bird that has just that one enlarged like dromaeosaurs. And they use it to pin and grab prey focusing on that enlarged claw. So they use it exactly the way this hypothesis predicts dromaeosaurs have been using it. So we do have a bird, terrestrial predatory bird, that is Mm -hmm. mostly walking, not flying to catch its prey, that is using an extremely similar shaped claw. Not quite as extreme in size, but very similar in its position, shape, and anatomy, and is using it in a way that fits this hypothesis. I also seem to remember there being some research uh, not too long ago that found that the claws of dromaeosaurs might not have been strong enough to withstand a very powerful blow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that you might have broken that claw trying to do a big old slash with it. Which absolutely, like, that makes sense because it is very easy for us to look at weapon-shaped things and think of weapon-style uses, mm-hmm. but bone and metal don't function the same way. No. It's very easy to break bone and keratin uh, when trying to use it the way you might use an axe. Yes, exactly. So it, it you can't just go off of the shape. You have to go off of the structure as well. There have also been other studies looking at bird claws and trying to interpret theropod, you know, our two-legged predatory dinosaurs, which are their cousins, and figure out lifestyles. Uh, I think we talked about a news not too long ago that looked at the shapes of claws and were identifying arboreal and predatory behaviors for certain near bird theropods yep. found things that the shape of claws match with things like perching and ground dwelling and predatory behaviors in birds and found support for arboreal lifestyles in Archaeopteryx and Microraptor, two famous feathered dinosaurs, mm-hmm. and predatory behavior for Confucius Ornus, which is super awesome. Another weird example I found of fossil claws is less so with how weird the claws are, but the distribution <laughs> and difference of claws on the feet of this animal. Sauropods. Sure. Have... Our big long neck dinosaurs. Big long neck dinosaurs have very unusual specializations in their digits from the front feet to the back feet. The front feet of many sauropods have reduced or lost the digits down to basically the thumb. So they'll have a thumb which has a claw on it, a, a thumb spike type thing, and then basically no other digits, and are just walking on the hand bones, so to speak, of that front limb. The back feet, though, still have, most of their digits still have notable claws. So very different structures from front feet to back feet, and very different claw anatomy, with just the one claw that is not shaped like the back claws, which are often much more flattened and even curved, but sideways. Yeah. Curved along the ground. Right. Kind of like when you, when you, if you look at like a croc mm-hmm. back foot or a lizard foot, the, the finger, the digits themselves, the toes are often kind of swept off to the side. Exactly. So there's been lots of research of like, all right, that much of difference suggests that there's some specialization going on. Mm-hmm. So what are you using these very different claw situations to do? None of them particularly seem to be for weight support which is the first thing that you look at when you talk about sauropods. Yes. Is, is this that's, because that's you're question big? question number one. Is this because you're gigantic? <laughs> and no, they don't really seem to be supporting weight or distributing weight. So that's not really a likely answer. When we look at the front limbs with that thumb claw and basically nothing else, this is common among sauropods. There are some groups, some titanosauriforms have lost that claw as well mm-hmm. and lost all the front digits or reduced or lost all the front digits. But many have that first claw still, and there have been many suggested ways it could be used. It could be used defensively, especially in uh, smaller sauropods that might have been able to raise up or wield it in a similar category. It could have been used for combat between the sauropods. Sure. That maybe this was a spike. Some have suggested that maybe it was a like in sloths and would have suggested for a lot of ground sloths that it was used to pull vegetation mm-hmm. in especially for your earlier sauropods. Some have suggested that maybe it was used for gripping onto a mate as they were mounting during copulation. Sure, sure, like that, claspers. That it's like a clasper, and you could lock into the hips or some area of the mate of your mate. But one that has 
gained actually a, a, a bit of support is grasping onto trunks for those that could raise up on their back limbs and hold on to a trunk to then reach up and get food with hmm. those claws. Interesting. Right? It is also notable that this claw can actually move a decent amount, it seems, up and down to either be held off the ground or pushed down into the ground. So it could just be for traction. Sure. It could just be to help grip or get it out of the way and have that little extra spike of maneuverability when you're trying to move over a surface, which is probably the simplest answer. Occam's razor wise, the back feet toes are much more notable. There's more of them. They are bigger claws, bigger claws. They are flat and thick, curved to the side often even overlapping with each other, so like just kind of clustered together. This unusual shape has led many to think that there's probably an unusual function to them, that they're not just, you know, standard walking around claws, that there is some other reason. They still definitely could be useful in gripping onto the ground and getting you traction. The back legs are the more powerful locomotor, locomotor legs of a sauropod, so that definitely would make sense. But there has been a number of research studies that have suggested that it could be for digging. Yeah, that, well, that's where I was thinking. Yep, that when we see evidence of sauropod nests, they are on the ground, not in trees, surprisingly, sure. and would have been excavated, dug out, and sometimes it seems even reburied. Mm -hmm. They are moving that earth. They did know that they could be doing this with their mouth or something like that, but probably feet make more sense, yeah. and that these back feet would be decent tools for that, Especially since we see very similar claws in tortoises. I was wondering. Mm -hmm. It was making me think. I was thinking specifically the image in my head was sea turtles. Yep, yep, yep. Which dig with their feet to dig out a nest. And they dig with their back feet. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, tortoises have those similar sort of pillar-like legs yep. with those big claws on them. And a lot of them will have similar curved, you know, strangely curved claws. These unguis. And they will use them for digging nests and even digging burrows for those that make their own burrows. Yeah, probably unlikely in sauropods. Yes, not, not, that would be a lot of digging. But that is potentially a use for these strange back claws, which are just unusual behaviors you might not suspect when looking at these animals unless you looked down at their claws. Another regularly studied area of claw evolution is primate claws or nails or Tegulae. Primates have a very interesting set of unguis of our claw-like structures because A, nails are unusual. Yes. Fingernails are weird when you look at most other animals. That's really only a primate thing. And then a couple other groups that have kind of more nail-like structures. But our specific setup with a flat nail on the top and a big old finger pad is a very primate situation specifically you primate which is our extant primates which split up into your lemur form primates the strepsorines and then the haplorines the dry nosed primates which include tarsiers and simians which is us you know apes but also your old world and new world monkeys we find ungulae fingernails tegulae which are the claw like nails and then also a structure called a grooming claw yeah which is a specialized claw-like feature, but it is typically angled much more up, a bit wider and deeper, and used mainly for grooming. You'll also hear it called a toilet claw. Mm -hmm. All of these structures are found in primates, though different ones are found in different groups on different digits. Interesting. Yep. Yeah, you... Grooming claws are a famous feature of primates, mm -hmm. but there is variation. Yeah, not all primates have them. Famously, we don't. Nope. Fingernails are by far the default primate that is most common which also makes it the most weird it is most commonly thought that nails came from claw ancestors but we're not sure how that transition happened we don't have a solid fossil record to show us how we went from claw to nail i did find at least one thing that mentioned that there at least have been researchers that have suggested that actually the original unguis would have been a nail and then claws came after, but I haven't found any other support for that. Hmm. But the evolution of nails is actually more mysterious than you might think. We're not sure how we got to these weird structures. Tegulae, which are thought to be 
specialized nails, though there have been some things that have interpreted them as more representative of the ancestral claw. But typically you'll see it described as a derived nail that has taken a claw-like shape. These are found in groups of the New World monkeys, marmosets and tamarins, and it's found on all their hand digits and the all the toes but the big toe. And similarly, in lemurs, in the eye eye, which is a lemur, the famous one with the long middle finger, it's found on all their fingers and then the outer three toes. This is one of those situations where you will often hear that tamarins are clawed primates. Mm -hmm. So this is a situation where that term will get kind of flip-flopped. And the truth is that there is no hard line between nail and tegulae. One thing put it very well that there exists a continuum from tegulae to nail when you look at those New World monkeys. That you have some that are very nail-like and then get more and more and more and more and more tegulae-like until they are very claw-like. Grooming claws, though, are very distinct structures and are typically found on the second toe in lemurs generally. It is also found in two New World monkeys, the owl and titi monkeys. It's found on the third toe of tarsiers, and this has actually been studied quite a bit as to whether or not the grooming claw is ancestral to primates or something that has shown up multiple times. Did we always have a grooming claw and then us anthropoids lost it and we lost it in most monkeys and apes or has it shown up multiple times some of the reasons that it's not that it might have shown up multiple times is because we have it commonly in prosimians the lemurs which you know leans it partially toward an ancestral feature but then it is completely absent in basically all of our other groups Minus the Tarsiers and two New World monkeys. But the fact that it's found in those groups is the reason there is the idea that it could have shown up multiple times. And if that's the case, likely three times. Once for the lemurs, once for Tarsiers, and then once for those two, at least the ancestor of those two New World monkeys. But it seems like most of the research leans toward it being a ancestral feature that was lost widely. This is partially based on recent research that identified... Some toe bones, because once again, we're missing the actual keratin sheaths, but the grooming toe bone is very distinct. It is shaped like a grooming toe bone. Some fossils going back to some of the oldest U primates, about 56 million years old, appear to have had grooming claws, which puts it back at the very beginning of U primate. Cool. The next question that many things will then ask is, all right, so is that a specialized claw or a specialized nail? Right. <laughs> Which is also hard to answer. Uh, there was one, at least one fossil I found they mentioned, North Arctus, that seems to have a grooming claw bone that is partway to being a grooming claw. So it could be suggesting that it was evolving from a non-grooming claw that would have been, from the features, more nail-like. So it could be that it is a specialized nail, but even those things are hard to pin down. Uh, some things have looked at the structure of our nails versus claws, you know, nails in primates and claws in other mammals. And earlier studies found that true claws, you know, the, the faculae were comprised of two different distinct layers, a superficial and a deep strata of keratin, whilst most primate nails were only made out of one layer, which was similar to the superficial stratum, and that the tegulae in many primates was shown to also be comprised of two layers similar to faculae, but the deep stratum was reduced, which would suggest that they are not specialized nails, but leftovers from ancestral claws hmm. in primates. But then more recent research has found that in certain groups, capuchin monkeys and some lemurs, the nails are comprised of two layers, similar to faculae and tegulae. To add more confusion to it, when they looked at some grooming claws, it was found to have one layer in some groups and two layers in others. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so even something as simple as our fingernail is actually a fairly complex evolutionary mystery right now that we're still trying to figure out and not in agreement on where it came from, evolutionarily speaking, and how we got here, let alone how we got the other weird things that other primates have. Yeah. Which will just about bring us to the end of our discussion. 
Will staring at his fingernails now, oh, yeah. uh, in a ponderous way. I, I, I loved learning about these. That's so weird. My nails are not visible because they're all pretty. <laughs> I got all sorts of stuff. That's the thing that was not mentioned uh, in this episode and most of those evolutionary discussions is nails as use for display structures. Right? <laughs> for attracting right. mates. And I say that as a, a, as a silly comment, but also, no, they, they're, absolutely. absolutely there are nails claws used in for display structures we talked about that when we talked about that there was an asaurus mm-hmm. news, that one of the purposes of big seemingly unwieldy claws could be for various displays uh, my favorite example of that is painted turtles which have males have very long front claws mm-hmm. specifically for tickling the faces of females right. in courtship <laughs> and so there are tons of super weird uses for claws as is usual with these kinds of episodes we could not even touch on a fraction of it all i'm sure we missed a lot of people's favorites sure tell us what your favorite claws are please do if you have a awesome example or favorite animal that uses its claws in some cool way share it with us share it on our social media we have a discord that you can go talk about it so sure can fill the discord with pictures of claws before we wrap up the episode though we do have one last section which is our patron question Every episode, we like to answer a question from one of our patrons, which you can ask us at certain levels for us to answer on the podcast. What is our patron question for today? Today's patron question is from Jackie, uh, and this is related to the discussion we had a little earlier about some dinosaur feet. Jackie says, I saw a post about how titanosaurs have no fingers and the front feet knuckle walk, ungulagrade, I suppose. But in the image, their back limbs were digitigrade with toes. Is this true? And are there any other non-flying tetrapods that stand differently in their front and back limbs? This is a great question. And getting into some terminology that we've discussed before, ungulagrade, as we mentioned before, uh, describes animals that stand on that very last toe bone, like horses and other hoofed animals digitigrade are animals that stand with the fingers on the ground but the hand and foot raised up like dogs and cats and dinosaurs tend to stand that way as well exactly and the situation with sauropods is a weird one because of that loss of front toes so you get a situation where they are walking on the ends of their only remaining front bones for those front legs But we would still consider that digitigrade because basically what's happened with titanosaurs is if you put your your hand on a table or something and then lift up the palm, that's digitigrade. You're walking on the digits. Your palm is up. We walk with the flat of our feet down. We call that plantigrade. That's how bears walk. That's how a lot of marsupials walk. If you lift up your hand, you're now walking digitigrade. If you were to walk on the tippy tippy tips of your fingers, you'd be ungulagrade. Titanosaurs got rid of the fingers, but they're still walking with their hand in the same position. Mm -hmm. So it's still just minus the digits, which is why the terminology (laughs) is a technical splitting of hair, but it is still that. And it can't, and and we should specify, not all sauropods are like this, not even all titanosaurs are like this. Yes. But there are some that have lost the digits. And even um, um, most have lost almost all but the thumb. So this is, you still would see most that are almost completely walking this way. It technically couldn't be ungulagrade because there's no ungules. Exactly. They've deleted the ungules, <laughs> so they cannot walk no on those. phalanges. <laughs> the back foot is still toed and still walking digitigrade. Mm-hmm. In a lot of artist representation, they won't look that way a lot of the time because there has been research that suggests they likely had a pad behind the back foot like elephants do. So it's shaped like a pillar even though the toes are actually arcing forward in front of this pad. Exactly. So they are functionally plantigrade with the back feet, but skeletally digitigrade. Yes. And then on the front legs, they are walking on the tips of their bones, but those tips used to be part of the palm. Right. So they are still technically digitigrade. So sauropods defy our terminology a little bit. Yes, because they're deleting a lot of the parts that we would have used... Right. That we named these terms off of. And adding in other stuff. Exactly. As far as do others do this, uh, I couldn't find any examples of known groups that are actually like digitigrade or plantigrade or ungulagrade at, with different limbs. Sure, sure. The only one I could think of as an example is like gorillas knuckle walking. Yeah. Which is the first thought that came to my mind is that they are not 
skeletally all that different, but they are using those hands and feet in different ways when they're moving around on the ground. Yes, that they're not dedicated to walking on those knuckles, but that's the closest I could think of as a, a non-flying example. Yeah, that's the first one that comes to mind. And then, of course, yeah, there's flying things that do all sorts of weird, like pterosaurs uh, seem to have absolutely been using their back feet, which I think were plantigrade. Yes, that's to my knowledge. But then those wings have been modified like crazy, and so they are using them completely differently when they're walking on the ground. But though, like, if they are still walking on those those remaining digits, I guess the question is, how how much of the palm is left? Right. Is it still technically plantigrade? Yeah. Is, the, is the palm flat on the ground? It, it, you know, even if your palm's the size of a quarter now, <laughs> if you're putting it down, you're technically plantigrade. So yeah, though these terms may seem arbitrary when we're looking at weird animals like sauropods, it's kind of like when we were talking about the counting of the toes, that we count from one to five from the inside to the outside. But if you delete one, we still keep two as two and three as three. You just lost one. Because just like here, it tells us the evolutionary story. Right. Even though you're missing toes, you're still digitigrade. So that way, if someone looked at the skeleton, I say it's digitigrade, you should get the hint of, oh, okay, there used to be toes in front of that. And that's why evolutionary biologists count teeth differently from dentists. Yep. <laughs> and you get different numbers depending on whose literature you're reading <laughs> because uh, dentists are not counting based on the evolutionary history of the teeth, just on what teeth are there. Yes, because we are still numbering <laughs> them with the absent ones in mind. Yes. So, good question, Jackie. Absolutely. Sauropods are so weird. So weird. And with that, we can wrap up this episode. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to all of our requesters and new patrons for suggesting this episode and joining us and supporting us. If you have questions, if you have more to say, there are tons of ways to get in contact with us in the description below. You can also support us down there with Patreon and Audacity and just saying how much you think we're cool. <laughs> We've got an email address, a physical mailing address, a bunch of social medias, a dedicated Common Descent podcast discord with lots of fun discussions that go on. We have a merch store where you can buy merch with some Common Descent stuff on it. All sorts of ways to get involved. And for this episode, there are links to two other podcasts down there because Will was on Lucas's podcast and we were both on I Know Dino. Make sure to check those out. So if, you, if you're not done hearing our voices, there is more out there. Keep an eye out and an ear out for more info on Croc and Snake Month coming up. And if you're on Patreon, go check out that post to help us get it ready. And with that, I think we can we can wrap this up. Uh, Wolverine only got mentioned once this episode because of the frog being called Wolverine. Thought about mentioning Wolverine. Also, there just in the fringes of my brain, there was a Santa Claus joke. Right, right. To be made somewhere that just never quite materialized. So yeah. that'll, just, that'll be in a future episode, I suppose. Uh, Wolverine, not True Claws. Not true claws. Not true claws. There's no uh, keratin sheet that I've even, ever seen. Even before before the surgery, mm -hmm. those are bone claws, and they're also not digits. Yep. Those are separate bony structures that's that that come from the hand and stick out through the skin. There's never I've never seen any sheath other than the artificial sheath of adamantium that is put over them later. So those uh, again are claw-like structures. Not true claws. Though, man, why has no one drawn it with a keratin sheet? That would look so cool. Of like big long Therizinosaurus claws coming out of his hands. Yeah, I, I guess this that is going to be a awesome. silly thing to say, but like biologically that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. No, not particularly. For the, the whole, keratin to be pulled inside. Yeah, the whole yeah. keratin sheath is pulled inside because the whole point is that they're retractable. But like, I don't know. Well, they've done like, you know, prehistoric Marvel stuff where it's like, don't you want to see Caveman Ghost Rider? Well, give me weird prehistoric Wolverine that's got permanent claw claws. I'll take it. On his hands. They also vary in various, especially animated depictions for where they actually come out. Yeah, if it's the back of the hand or between the Sometimes knuckles. Sometimes it's between the it's between the fingers. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. is how that shows it whenever they show them in the movies is specifically coming between mm -hmm. those. So, yeah. Not yeah. true claws, but I'm not going to argue with Wolverine. <laughs> no, no, don't tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. 
You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.